It was initially conceived as um, a, cl a closing event, um, meaning, meaning uh, an event in, at which people mm, c compare notes and talk to each other a little bit more and have some refreshments and, I don't know, network exchange cards, uh, say, let's do lunch. Um, and uh, also we have uh, some local programming uh, to celebrate the place where we are. And this is, the idea was, in fact, um, that to, to, to sort of counter the long-standing uh, sometime tradition <laughs> of uh, just sort of hibernating in the hotel for a, a few days and then not seeing too much of the community. And so we decided to put together some local programming and I was especially pleased that at the end of the RFP um, process we had a few possible places we were going to go. Uh, we end up, ended up coming to Milwaukee because as a result of the Milwaukee selection, I got to see one of my favorite uh, former students from the University of Iowa, now a faculty member at um, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, uh, who is this year's conference organizer. Give it up for Leah Leone. One of my favorite things about this conference is how uh, has been how we've left the building and we had our readings at the public library. We brought Alta to the public, and um, now we're bringing some of the public here to Alta. Um, the readers that we're having tonight are local writers here in Milwaukee, and uh, it's really exciting to have them here. Um, We have three readers that will be joining us. Um, the first are Meg Newton and Kimberly Blazer, who are both English professors at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I'll just tell you a little bit about them. Uh, poet, photographer, and essayist Kimberly Blazer is a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Her publications include three books of poetry, Trailing You, winner of the first book from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas, Absentee Indians and Other Poems, and Apprentice to Justice. Blazer's writing has been widely anthologized, most recently in the Heath Anthology of American Literature, and her poetry has also been translated into several languages, including Spanish, Norwegian, Indonesian, and French. A Vashanabi ancestry and an, and an enrolled member in the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, Blazer grew up on the White Earth Reservation in northwestern Minnesota, and much of her writing arises from her embedding in this culture and place. Therefore, the collection with Meg Newton to bring her poems fully home to Ashwin has been particularly welcome. The first of these translations was published in a recent issue of Hayden's Fairy Review. Our other reader um, is Margaret Newton, who is a poet and assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is the author of Bawajimo, a dialect of dreams in Ashwanabi language and literature, and Wenwi, a collection of bilingual poems in Ojibwe and English. Her poems and essays have been anthologized and published in Sing, Poetry from the Indigenous Americas, the Michigan Quarterly Review, Walter Stone Review, and Cream City Review. She sings with Ms. Kwawasing Nagamoji, the Swamp Singers, a women's hand drum group whose lyrics are all in Ash Ashwanabawin and hosts a network of web resources for learning Ashwinavuin. So, uh, we'll welcome them up. We're going to have three series of readers tonight, so we'll have some readings, take a break, get some more food, another drink, and we'll have some more readings like that. So, thank you. Good evening, Bushu. Ani, it's the same way, in, we speak the same language and there's multiple ways to, to greet folks, so you just heard both. <laughs> so I'm Kim Blazer and 
we are going to do two sets of poems. Um, Meg and I are both poets, and we're going to read, I'm going to read mine first that Meg has graciously translated for me. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how those translations took place, and then we're going to read some of her poems, um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the way that these are conceived and the translations are different. Yours. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, what, one of the things that we thought would be interesting to share with folks here is the fact that because Anishinaabe Mwen is a language that is still being revitalized, it has nearly been lost in the Great Lakes area. In Wisconsin, it's estimated that there's maybe about 20 speakers left that are first language speakers of the language. And we have one school that is an immersion school right now, but it's a language that's very much endangered and we are trying to bring it back. And so there's different ways to approach it. So Kim writes her poem poems in English, and then what I did was try very, very faithfully, being true to every single line, to, to match the meaning, not worrying as much about am I maximizing every little sound and choosing every word that might have the most poetic potential. Whereas my poems are the reverse, where I write them in Anishinaabe Mwen, and I write them for how they sound in Anishinaabe Mwen, and then I provide an English translation so that my poems always feel to me a little more alive in an Anishinaabe Mwen, and then the English is the reverse, where the translation is merely matching so that you can get the meaning from them. So there, it's a little bit different. You get to hear two sides of how we're bringing the language back. Um, I think the other thing that's worth saying, since you all came to Minowa King, so Milwaukee is an Anishinaabe word. It means good earth, and Wisconsin means red stones. So in fact, if you even booked your flight and showed up in this city, you're already speaking Anishinaabe Mwen, for which we thank you. <laughs> Okay, and even within um, the, the four poems of mine that we're going to read, um, the process was a little bit different. So Meg was doing some work with a publication and she, ooh, um, she worked with three poems where she primarily simply um, elicited the poems and did the translations. And then the very last one I'm going to read, we did some collaborative back and forth talking about what this might mean, how it might symbolize something, and, and how could that um, go, go forward in both languages. So we're going to start with um, Dreams of Water Bodies. Which is Nibi Wiawan Bawadanan. Wajusk, small whiskered swimmer, you a fluid arrow crossing waterways with the simple determination of one who has dived purple deep into mythic quest. Wajusk, agachiing, me missionowe bagazot, biwak dagamagadayan, mashka windamian, gogi washkawanayamban, demi minandek, gagwe diambam. Belittled or despised as water rat on land, hero of our Anishinaabe people in animal tales, creation stories, whose tellers open slowly, magically, like within a dream, your tiny clenched fists, so all water tribes might believe. Gopazomegok, Nini Chiwabaganuji Aking, Ogichida Anishinaabe. Awen siyana jamoing, adesokang, dash, debajamojik, onisakananawa, nengach, enjimamanjiriang, gadobikwanadi jens, mi dash, kina, nishinabe, debwe endamowat. See the small grains of sand, ah, only these poor few, but they become our turtle island, this good and well-dreamed land where we stand in this moment on the edge of so many bodies of water and watch Wajusk, our brother, slip through pools and streams and lakes, this marshland earth hallowed by the memory, the telling, the hope, the dive of sleek whiskered swimmers who mark a dark path. Wabandanan Neguanan Asa Ongoeta Maji Mashkishi Minis Minawabandan Aking Mampi Niganagabawing Agamagang Wajashk Wabmang Nikananik Jibasege Zagaigan Gai Zibansan 
Mashkik Shawendaman, Meek Gwendaman, Wawendaman, Eja Bugasendamawat, Eja Gogiwat, Agashiant, Memishanowet Bugazojik, Dibiki Miknong. And sometimes in our watery dreams, we pitiful land dwellers in longing recall and singing make spirits ready to follow Bakobi. Nanagodnong enjinibi bwajaganan, gidemagozajik, ah king and dying, bakadendaman, dash, nagamoying, jibanakaying, no sanoigaying, bakobiying. Okay, so we should have probably said prior to that, um, was just is uh, the story that that poem is based off is a creation story, um, and it is about finding our turtle earth. The next poem um, is it's based upon the, the jingle dress, which is a dress for powwows and. If you were to see it laid out on the page, you would see that it is also a physical poem where the, the language actually mirrors the shape of a jingle. Do you have that one as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're doing... In this one, um, because, it, because the shape was one side off another, we're going to try to do line by line. Um, and that seemed, because Meg was able to follow the shape of this in her translation. Jingles you made for Bill Antel. Gigi jibaska iganake. Cut from tobacco tins. Gigi gishkanan se ma kikwab konsan. Snuff lids and coffee cans. Agwananjigan, gibaiganan, minua makdimash kikiabo kikonsan. Bent round and pounded. Wawia bigadonan, minua nagabadandan. Silver cones tinkle. Wabash kabizika jibasiganan bidwesen. Against red. Misquanding. Jingle one against another. Mamwe chibidwe wesen. As I dance in the June sun. Epichinimia megwa ode menegizis. Place my feet just so. We wene da koya. Finding the rhythm. Na nagadawea of the drums bakish degwewat as each tiny metal symbol gains jibasigans deba bedwesen clinks in time deba bedwesen dangling from the ribbons a godezenebang on my fawn brown dress godans gidakons inandek they swing and jingle we we bizon idash bedwesen at my step a pichinimia Silver cylinders singing Wabashka Okajbikona am and my moccasins tap in and down Ni such a chizebidiana aqua jishbiania move evenly Joshkia around the arena to the song Wanaskea Nagamong circling and again Aja Minua now beneath my hair Nongwanibuyan sweat Trickles Abuezoya. as passing the stand, Dash Gibkoyan. I glance up, Dash Dutaganabinan. Catch your eye, Dutaganabimian. The twinkle there, Jibaniwayan. So much, Up Chigo, like a sound, Dibishko. We made, Gimenotogizian, together, Mamwe. Ho, a ho. <laughs> okay. And then um, the third one is a butterfly poem. Um, is this the one you share? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm loud enough behind you. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> this cocoon. No nindoese. Fluttering against my palm, pollened wings. Bob bimase, ninga koninjining, bingwio oninguiganong. Quick life pulsing in my hand. We weep in a dozen, bapa ongong, ninjining. A feather tickle answered by my flying heart, my child's glee, my hand's impulsive, frantic opening too soon. Miguan and ginachjina, dash onak toywen, nde baba misse, min wenda gozia, nin inch binskaya, nisakanan wewiba. 
you fly. Again, encircling you, cocoon spun of flesh, winged vibrations surprise me again. Minua, gigitwishkayam, non duese, weyen asapke, jichse wak, oningwiganan, minua, goshkomian. Tingling, a child of secrets, must not tell. Gikimanzi, nijanis, gawingimu dajimisi. I ask, forgive me and give me leave. Share this portion of butterfly life. Let me tap your joy, break out for a moment with wings. Gagwejimin, bongidat tawishin, minua bogdanishin, jimada oki, me mengwa nadazi. We fly. Nimba ba misimin. Two. Butterflies ride my thoughts. Three butterflies have lighted, affixed themselves like pinions to my left shoulder. I am winged, struck with awe. Butterfly, has my life glowed sweet as yours, that you have come to feel human flutter? In this gift or enchantment I am captured, seek not to win release, held fast by butterfly feet. Me mengwa gi was konea, ejuishkabimadzia, dash, zamanent, ejinishnabe baba miset, mi migwayanong, mamanjiwanong, Gachidian, Gegwa, Gidogoji Bagidnike, Namingemeshkawishin, Me Mengwa. From this cocoon, take flight. Ma John, Nonamo Dewese, Ma Jisin, Baba Misin. Okay, and the last one of my poems is um, not to bring you down, but it is a poem about death and about understanding of death or trying to. Um, and what we can do in our place as we find ourselves now. Afterwards, because the smallness of our being is our only greatness, because one night I was in a room listening until only one heart beat, because in these last years I've worn and worn and nearly worn out my black funeral shoes. Because the gesture of afterwards means the same thing no matter who speaks them. Because faith, belief, forever are only words, no matter. Because matter disappears always and eventually. Because action is not matter, but energy that spent changes being. <laughs> And if death too is a change of being, perhaps action counts. And if death is a land of unknowing, perhaps we do well to live with uncertainty. And if death is a forested land, it would be good to learn trees. And if death is a kingdom, it would be good to practice service. And if death is a foreign state, we should loosen allegiance to this one. And if the soul leaves our body, then we must rehearse goodbye. Megishpin pina boying et the anja saying, Gonama abdek ga ishichigaying. Megishpin nibo an akin ga wingi kendazian. Gonama abdek namanja bimadazian. Megishpin nibo in mitigwa king awan gonama abdek mitigongi kendaming. 
Migish bin Niboyan Ogimakwing, Awan Ganama Abdek Gojibam Tageing. Migish bin Niboying, Agamaking, Gonama Abdek Gawin, Mampi Onjibasing, Mi Gish bin Ojichak, Weoing, Nagadang Gonama Abdek Ndo, Bimo Sadamageying. The thing you should know, so one is, we've never done this before, so <laughs> it's really interesting. It's Thank you for asking us to do this, because A, I don't know that we've ever had translation groups kind of take seriously our language and hear it, so for us to hear our language in this venue is wonderful. It's also, when it becomes performative, I find that I have to follow her, the music of what she's saying, not just her words. So, so thank you for pushing me to do that, because before I was just writing what she said, now I had to hear it and then try to read it as well as you have, which was, which was hard. <laughs> so, but I hope it worked. Now, so these are short. Mm -hmm. yes. so, should we just do some of these? So, so now we have some, Which is Meg funny. has some poems that are, they're very much shorter than mine. I, I tend to be long-winded. Um, <laughs> and um, she is going to read the Anishinaabe Moen first, and I'll follow that with the English. So you'll get the opposite taste of how that works. So hopefully in these, what you'll hear is that, they, because they were written in Anishinaabe Moen first, you should hear some play of the, both the phonemes and the morphemes and the language in just sort of a different way. So I also have a poem that starts out about a muskrat, but because in our language muskrats live near swamps and mushrooms, those words are in there and you hear how those words are similar. So I'll read it first and then you can read the English. Wajashkok, wajashkwidon sing. Inj begone aga zikka wak, a kak janze o wak, o jachaka yen suck, anishna bemuat. O kanawan, gikanaman amanik, gae o jib kan gibozoat, megwa, miniquayanga mashkoabo, zinzibako adabo, gi wendamak, me bagadendagoziang, jinimiang, wajash quidonsing. Muskrats in mushrooms. In the hole where they hide their little gray souls, they sing in an Ishinabe Moen. Our cousins' bones with the roots are roasting while we drink the swamp water syrup you have all forgotten. So we are free dancing in the mushrooms. Gimijanonic, me gwanak gimijanonic. Mi sanjoe young bizikamawat, e pichidabish go minojuan, e jinimiwat, mi rush, o zawaganewak, we sagodek, we sagodeng, up ta mitgomish, up ta ginebigobak, Mizatigan, an angash awiwat, adwejik, enginawanch adwewen, Ginijan sanak wajangwa, a shamagwa, oshki and endamawan, and me ganabach gawin wa, migadesiwat. We give them. We give them plumes and quills and downy tips to wear while dancing like smooth currants. They become golden feathered half-breeds in the burnt forest, part oak, part fern. Solid branches, soft bracken, they are traders in an evolved economy. Our decorated children, nourished on new ideas, possibly able to avoid old battlefields. Wa windamojik, nana godno ni jingame wan mi we up pigi gi winamot. A kiens yak biminawak bingwe wa windamawinan. Gi wa windamawat en jizagading. Mindamoy en sak gi bozana wan de bajamon binish ombishka awasa de wetagot. No shin suck o zagi awan zam gash kittoat, anishna in the moat de jamadzewat. Oni jant and shuck, gi zegzewak, zam geek and the moat and goading wa eje de bajamoat. The promisers. Sometimes the rain came twice, and that is when they lied. The old men twisted the dusty promises they once made as young lovers. The old ladies baked the tales until they rose beyond believability. The grandchildren adored them for this ability to reimagine their lives. Their own children were frightened by the idea of what they themselves would one day say. 
you can tell it was a lot easier for me to read mine <laughs> than it was for me to read hers in English. So, all right, then the last thing that we thought we would just share since we knew we had a little finite amount of time. Um, another thing, as you announced, I don't know where you've gone off to, Leah, but at any rate, the group that I sing with is Miskwasening Nagamojik because as we try to teach our language and bring our language back, um, one of the things we're often trying to do is bring especially women together and sing. And I've been able to, um, all of you guys are language folks, so you understand how hard it is sometimes to get busy adults to keep practicing their language and to get them to actually conjugate everything and use all of the things they know. <laughs> so some of the songs that we've written, I've like cunningly put in their transitive animate verbs and negative. <laughs> so, so, so that was a thing that I was trying to do. And there was a song, a Nina Simone song, about just feeling good. And when we were looking at all of our poems tonight, it was a balance of both of us remembering folks we've lost, thinking about some folks we know right now that we're kind of holding in our hearts and hoping that their journey is easy, and, and also remembering that in the midst of all that, you need to still try and feel good and, and life goes on. So we took the song that was originally kind of a jazz standard song and we translated it. So I'll try and just sing you a little piece of that because, you know, there are no expectations. You only thought I was going to read. So if I sing, it can't be too bad, right? So, so we typically sing things in four. So one of the things that we did was adapt it so that it had four stanzas and it has a little bit of a kind of chorus to it. So if you know the song, you know what Nina Simone sings. She basically sings that the world around her is part of the reason that she feels good. Benation suck in a sedota him. Gizis gizigong in a sedota in. Jibon martin don a sedotan. Shkibid abon shkigigigad. Oshkibim ahadziam in omeno Giguya chigamegong in isidota im. Zibing minajwang in isidota im. Bash kabagoni in isidota. Shkibida ban shkigigigad. Shkibima hadziam in omenoya. O bodash kwan shi gena nisadota in. Me men walk, men wendago hozi walk. Me no guaman de hibikong. Shkibida ban shkigigigad. O shkima hadziam in amenawayaya. Wasa anongon suck in a sedota in. Jing walk men all go zig in a sedota in. Nimba gikenda minua nisidota So that was just our fun thing we did. Yes. <laughs> Which now do we walk off the stairs? <laughs> Wow, that was spectacular. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll let you take a few minutes to grab another drink, get something else to eat, um, and then we'll be having a, a Farsi fiction writer and a documentarian who'll be coming up with her translator. Um, so just take a few minutes and we'll bring up our next readers. All right, everyone, uh, we're going to bring up our next set of speakers, uh, readers and translators. Um, this next pair I met last year, they came and did a talk at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee about their translation process. Uh, Mariam Saperi uh, was born in Iran. She began her university career by studying medicine and then worked for a few years in a medical lab. After that, she returned to school to get a BA in film editing in 2010 and an MA in photography in 2012. For many years, she has made short films and taken photographs, as well as writing short stories and translating from English into Farsi. Mariam Saperi's documentary film, Rain Once Again, from 2012, won the award for the best documentary film at the Sora International Short Film Festival 
and was nominated in this category at the 28th Tehran International Short Film Festival. Her next documentary, Thicker Than Paint, from 2013, won the special Cream City Cinema Jury Prize at the 5th Milwaukee Film Festival. Her photographs have been exhibited in Iran, Italy, and Germany, and her short stories and travelogues, some with accompanying photographs, have been published in Iran in book form and in magazine form. She's now at work on her next documentary film. And Pat Lund translates her into English. They work together. Um, so Pat is retired from teaching Spanish linguistics at Michigan State University, but she continues to, she continues to publish in that field. She is the co-author of the textbook Investigación de Gramática and the manual for William Ball's Visual Grammar of Spanish. She is also active as a translator and is the co-author of En Otras Palabras, a textbook that uses translation to teach Spanish grammar. Her translation of a collection of short stories by the Catalan author Joan Cabré, uh, Vintage de Verne, Winter Journey, was published in 2009. Uh, so we'll bring them up now. None of you would want to uh, be the second act after that act. I just would like to tell you that there will be no singing. But uh, we have done a translation together simply because Mariam is here in the United States living out her residency requirement to become a U.S. citizen. She stays in my house and we decided that we would translate a story that she wrote while she was here. I don't speak Farsi. Um, so she explained to me what the story was about and I made it into English. I translate from Spanish and Catalan languages that I know. The process is very dissimilar from what I'm used to. <laughs> uh, so Mariam's going to tell you a little bit about what this story is about and then we have chosen some sections from the story that, that we will read to you. Mariam will read a section in Farsi and I will read this section in English. Uh, the story is very, very visual, very descriptive. Uh, it would probably be impossible to translate a different kind of story, a different style that was very syntax-based. It certainly would be impossible for someone who didn't speak the language. But this particular story, because it is extremely, extremely visual, it seems to me possible, possible to translate as long as I was informed about what it was I was to see. So Mariam will tell you a little bit about this story and then you, you will hear it in Farsi and English. Thanks for inviting us here. Uh, Pat was really patient, really and truly patient with me. Uh, I really love uh, details when I write short stories and this one has a bit more of whatever I did before. So it was really tough for her to understand because uh, my knowledge in English, my vocabulary is this much. And she tries to make it, make it perfect. Uh, it was a really tough experience, but very interesting because we had to, uh, we tried many different things to uh, be closer to the text, to what I wrote. Uh, we looked at different maps, we went to different websites. Uh, um, I tried to find some images, pictures, whatever, <laughs> to be closer to, the, to what I wrote and um, having her translate it. <laughs> You're going to, the story is, is very complicated and not linear. But it is about two brothers who are very different from one another. G, who is a scientist, and as it transpires, not a very nice person. And his brother P, who is an arty type. P's best friend is the lover of the woman whom G wanted to marry. And she turned him down, even though she was unmarried and pregnant. So G uh, takes his revenge in, during the story. So that's 
all you need to know about the plot. So, so here it comes in Farsi. And uh, one more tiny thing, Stad. I cannot publish this in Iran because uh, their job is making homemade wine. So, <laughs> which is forbidden. Yeah, which is forbidden. <laughs> okay. یانوش رودروف بوی خاک عره و پاک, پاک کن میداد. مداد کوتاهی پشت گوش چپش میگذاشت. موهای سرخ و سفیدش را با ماشین اصلاح میکرد. وقتی خجالت میکشید، خوابش میامد یا به چیزی در دور دست ها فکر میکرد، پشت گردن سرخش را مرتب با دست میمالید. مداد کوتاه را محض احتیاط روی گوشش جا به جا میکرد. وقتی خیالش راحت میشد که مداد سر جایش است، دست به عره میبرد. پشت گوش دیگرش سیگاری آماده گیراندن داشت. عره برقی زیر سقف کوتاه کارگاه نجاری زجه میزد و استوانه های کلوفت و کوتاه چوب از عره به زیر میغلتیدند. یانوش سطح صاف و نرم الوارها را نوازش میکرد. صفحه ای را که از خاک عره سفید شده بود از کنار بسات قهوه بر می داشت. با دم گرمش فوتی پرزور بان می کرد. با دستان ماهر و تنومندش گرامافون را پیش می کشید. پس گردن سرخش را با دست می مالید. مداد را محض احتیاط روی لاله صورتی گوشش جا به جا می کرد. صفحه را به نرمی سر جایش می گذاشت. سوزن را روی شیار صفحه رها می کرد. صفحه تابی می خورد و سینه چاک می کرد زیر گزش سوزن. ستاباد ماتر ویوالدی رنج های مادر باکره، با صدای کانتر تنور خواننده ای که مرد و زنش هیچ معلوم نبود زیر پنجره سقفی موج برمی داشت و سر ریز می شد توی خاکره ها که زیر تابش و صبانه ی تیز نور رقصان در هم می پیچیدند یانوش رودراف smelled of erasers and sawdust he had the habit of sticking the stub of a pencil behind his left ear he kept his graying red hair very short When he was shy or sleepy or lost in thought, he would rub his neck. Before he began to saw, he would make sure the pencil stub was behind his left ear. Behind his right ear was a cigarette waiting to be lit. The shrieking saw in his low-ceilinged workshop turned out log after log. He would stroke the cut surfaces. He would take a sawdust-covered record from the table that held the coffee things and send a warm puff of air over it and pull out the record player with his big, skillful hands. He would rub his neck and check the pencil stub behind his pink ear and carefully position the record. He would lower the needle onto the grooves. The record would start to spin and lay itself open to the needle's bite. Vivaldi's Stabat Mater, sung by, sung by a countertenor who sounded like either a man or a woman, rose like a wave to the skylight. It overflowed into the cone of light filled with dancing sawdust. The saw would shriek, the needle would spin, and the singer's sad voice would get lost in the noise. When he turned off the saw, it was a relief. The voice and the instruments could be heard. The sawdust would slow in the bluish light. The voice enchanted P. They would drink wine, they would eat nougat, Eleni's homemade wine was expensive, but it was seductive. When the record stopped, when the saw was turned off, P would read to Yanush from Ketabe Hafte, a liter literary magazine that is no longer published. Yanush made all kinds of things out of wood, balusters, Polish chairs, and frames for the Nastalik calligraphy of Mr. Moadeb, which means apprentice, not Mr. Moadab, which means master. And recently, a swing for Eleni's apricot tree. دیسیپلین به اضافه سخت گوشی اکسلنس است. این نوشته به نست تعلیق بود. رسم الخط آقای معدب به کسر دال. دست نوشته ای از قابی از چوب افرا. قابی که یانوش نجار به سفارش پ آن را همراه یک قاب بزرگتر ساخته بود. قاب ها سالهای سال دفتر آزمایشگاه بغرات را آراسته بودند. قاب بزرگتر برای یک کپی باسمه ای از یکی از آثار رامبران ساخته شده بود، با اینکه ترکیب بندی کلمات دیسیپلین و اکسلنس برای معدب به کسر دال کاری دشوار بود، دست آخر او با تلاش زیاد و به خاطر ارادتش به پ آن را ابدا کرد. کاری که در هنر خوشنویسی گامی مثبت و موثر بود. هرچند دکتر قاف مثل چیزهای نامربوط دیگر این پیروزی را به خودش نسبت میداد، در حقیقت تنها چیزهایی که به او مربوط میشدند، اصرار او بر ترجمه نشدن اکسلنس و دیسیپلین به تعالی و نظم بودند. به گمان دکتر کلمات اینطور آکادمیک تر بودند دیسیپلین و اکسلنس 
از دیگر سو نشان می دادن قاف علاوه بر تسلط به آلمانی لغت انگلیسی را هم خوب می داند. Excellence is the result of discipline and hard work. This saying was written in Nastalik calligraphy by Mr. Moadab, not Moadab. It was in the maple wood frame made by Yanush, which had been ordered by P, along with a larger and more elaborate frame. For years, these frames had decorated Dr. G's office in the lab. The second frame held a reproduction of a painting by Rembrandt. The proper composition of the non-Farsi words excellence and discipline was a challenge for Mr. Moadeb, but in the end, he managed to come up with something for P's sake. What he did was a genuine contribution to the art of calligraphy, though Dr. G took credit for it, and for other things as well. In fact, G could take credit only for insisting that excellence and discipline appear as transliterations, not as their Farsi translations. He thought that transliterations were superior, more excellent, and disciplined. In addition, they showed that he knew English as well as German. P did not disagree about not translating the words into Farsi. In his incessant desire to make people happy, he paid Moadeb to write out the saying and gave the frames to his brother to mark the opening of the lab. پی از بی خوبون با قاف فرق داشت. قاف در کودکی با تیر و کمان چشم کلاقی را از کاسه درآورده بود و در تضادی چشمگیر په بچه گربه های لنگ را برای تیمار کردن به خانه می آورد. شاید اینها چیزهای مهمی در کارنامه کودکی آدم ها نبودند اما قاف از این در شگفت بود که چرا موضوعی تا این اندازه خورد باید در ذهن همه بستگان دور و نزدیک حک شده باشد. هیچ کس نبرد نابرابر قاف با گونتر گرهارد فون هاگن را در زمستان های استخانسوز های هایدلبرگ ندیده بود. پ تحت و غاری را همان روزها بود که به دار فنون فرستاده بودند. پدر تاجر خوشخیال بیش از آن که هزینه تحصیل قاف در فرنگ کرده باشد برای پ هزینه می کرد. سال دوم دبیرستان بود که په بی مقدمه اعلان کرده بود که دیگر به مدرسه نمی رود و می خواهد نجار شود. از فردای آن روز هم خیلی مرتب و سر لجاجت رفت نجار خانه رودروف به جز شاگردی نجار که برایش درآمدی ناچیز داشت از پس مانده الوارها جانورهای عجیب و غریب می ساخت و اسم مقامات دولتی را روی رویشان میگذاشت نیمه قهر و نیمه آشتی با پدر و مادر و قاف و خواهرها اسبابش را کشید و برد خانه خانم جون و مستقر شد اتاق زیر شیروانی برای خودش کتابخانه ساخت و تمام سال آن زیر ماند و کتاب خواند P and G seemed to be made of entirely different materials. G had once blinded a magpie with his slingshot, while P would take in lame cats. Everyone who knew them remembered these things, and G was surprised that people held on to these insignificant facts. Nobody remembered his unequal struggle with the bone-chilling cold of Heidelberg or with Gunter Gerhardt. Why did no one remember how they'd worked on a research project together, and then that shameless man published the results under his own name? During the brief time he was in Iran for his father's funeral, it became obvious to him that he shouldn't leave his father's successful business in the hands of his unreliable younger brother. P was perfectly capable of wasting money on arty get-togethers, where his poet friends would drink wine and eat nougat and get excited about causes both political and romantic. Who cared about those causes? His insignificant little brother was very popular, more popular than G. Even in the days after the government had removed him from his teaching job, and he was working as the manager of the Hippocrates Laboratory. قاف آن روز دل هراور آن شادی آمیخته به حراس و بحشت تنیده در خنده های بیمانی را که از ته وجودش تا حلقش بالا می آمد از یاد نمی برد. زنگ تلفن وسط آین چرت بعد از ظهر از خاطرش نمی رفت. زنگ بی موقع تلفن با سرود تنبلی آرد به چشمان تو خواب وحشت برندامش انداخته بود از اداره پزشکی قانونی تماس می گرفتن در وقت غیر اداری خبر را که شنید انگار بار سنگینی از دوشش افتاده باشد از نبودنش به خود لرزید اول نفس راحتی کشید یک باره درون سیاه چالهی بلیده شده بود چند و چون ماجرا را با علاقه و اظهار تأصفی تصنعی پرسجو کرد باور خبر بی اندازه سخت بود تای دلش شرری از شادی که سر برکشیدن داشت زیر خاک سر ناباوری خفه می شد. مرگی که باورش نکنی مرگ نیست. با خودش حرف می زد. از او چه می خواستند؟ خواب بود یا بازی تازه؟ حتی از برملا شدن خبت رامبران تکاندهنده تر بود. اما هنوز زنده بود تا با حوشیاریش پلی بین این دو خبر بزند. 
اول باید یاد می گرفت باورش کند مرگ را سرنوشت جسد سرگردانی که به جلسه آن بعد از ظهر و تصمیم او بسته بود دکتر جی کنید فرگت دات هارفاین دی the mixture of fear and happiness, the senseless way he'd laughed with fear. He couldn't forget the way the telephone rang during his ritual afternoon nap. He'd forgotten to unplug it. The ringing telephone and the school anthem filled him with fear. The call was from the morgue, outside of working hours. He felt terrible when he heard the news. He was shocked to feel lighter, as if a familiar load had fallen from his shoulders. He took a deep breath. The unfamiliar lightness and emptiness gradually became unbearable, as if a weight that had kept him attached to the earth had been sucked away. He asked for details as if he were interested in them, and he pretended to be sorry. Accepting that news was unbelievably hard. The ember of happiness inside him was smothered by the ashes of denial. When you don't accept a death, it's not really death, he said to himself. What did they want from him? Was it a game or a nightmare? First, he had to accept it, the death. The fate of that wandering corpse depended on the decision made by Dr. G and the others. The earth had rejected the corpse, and the rivers Allende had spit it out. This was the way it had to be. Every ethnic group had its own rules. It was not Dr. G's fault. He was not the earth. It is the earth that decides whom to accept and whom to reject. Dr. G was there to practice medical science. من روز آفتابی اواخر تابستان النی می درخشید. نوبت اول پایکوبی بر انگورهای آن سال بود. موهای بلند خرمایی‌اش را با فرقی از میان پیشانی باز به دو سو بافته بود و بافته را گرد مثل دو نان گیسباف شیرمال بالای دو گوشش پیچانده بود. پیراهنی خوش دوخت به تن داشت. بالاتنه یقه خشتی پیراهن یک سر رنگ شراب بود. تا وقت پایکوبی رد انگور بر آن نماند. پلیسه های ریزی روی هم خوابیده از زیر یقه تا نرمی کهربایی پوست سینه النی پیش می آمدند. وسط خشت یقه دو دکمه سوزنی ریز مثل دو توپ از صدف شکاف سینه را تا پایین برجستگی خوشترکیب آن به نرمی به هم می آوردند. درست زیر سینه چین های سوزنی ریز دامن شرابی را که غرق در شبدرهای سبز درخشان بود با پیچ های نیلوفری تا زیر زانو می کشان. النی دوروبر چهل سالگی بود. یا شاید چهل سالگی دوروبر او میپلکید چینهای شکننده و ریز پای چشمانش دو خط باریک حاشیه دو سوی لبها کم کم دهان باز میکرد During this period G expected to hear at any moment from one of the cemeteries which were multiplying in his mind but no answer was forthcoming Just a minute we seem to be having a technical difficulty No, I read that one. No, after that, there's another one. Fine. You read, you read the last one. This is. The, it's. Oh, maybe. We're out of, we're out of order, but never mind. As I said, the story isn't linear, so it's okay. So, if you needed, if you needed any proof that I really don't speak Farsi, there it, there it is. Okay. So this is the translation of what she just read, which actually in the text comes after the thing we're going to read last. Okay. On that sunny day in late summer, Eleni shone. It was the first time that year for trampling the grapes. Her long auburn hair was parted down the middle and braided, and the braids were wound over her ears into two buns. The seamstress had done a good job with her dress. The wine-colored bodice had a square neck. The color wouldn't show stains when they trampled the grapes. A row of tiny pleats around the neckline framed her soft, milky skin. Two round shell buttons closed the bodice over the curve of her breasts. Under it, the same fabric printed with green clovers fell into a full skirt. Eleni was turning 42, though the number meant nothing to her. There were tiny wrinkles under her eyes and deepening lines on either side of her mouth. And now, <laughs> this one, right? Yeah. Okay. هفته ها می گذشت و خبری از گونتر نبود. کابوس های اسرانه قاف توانش را رو بوده بودند. هر لحظه انتظار می کشید از یکی از قبرستان ها که در خیالش بیشتر و بیشتر می شدند پاسخی سریح بشنود. شورای خلیفگری ارامنه هنوز با دفن نجار موافقت نکرده بود. قاف شادی هولنگیزی را تجربه می کرد. حسی از سرخوشی و درد جانش را پر کرده بود. سفارت لهستان پاسخی قاطع نمی داد. همه می دانستند. یانوش از کودکان لهستانی بود که در نیمه جنگ دوم جهانی از اردوگاه های سیبری همراه مادرش جان به در برده بود و به ایران رسیده بود از راه خزر به انزلی و بعد اصفهان 
اما سفارت لهستان نام او را ثبت نکرده بود دقیق تر این که سفارت آخرین بازمانده لهستانی را زنی می شناخت که هنوز زنده بود و قدر مسلم یانوش نجار نبود اداره پزشکی قانونی به آشوری های کاتولیک کلدانی هم نامه نوشته بود و از آنها درخواست کمک کرده بود اما آنها کپی نامه را به آشوری های ارتودکس و پروتستان ارجاع داده بودند و پاسخ آنها هم منفی بود پس از ناامیدی از آخرین دستاویز پیروان کلیسای نسوری دیگر خاکی نمونده بود که یانوش را در خود بپذیرد During this period G expected to hear at any moment from one of the cemeteries which were multiplying in his mind but no answer was forthcoming from the Armenian council about burying the carpenter G was experiencing an eerie kind of happiness he was filled with a combination of bliss and pain the Polish embassy had not responded Yanush was one of those Polish children who'd sought asylum in Iran, along with his mother from Siberia. They'd gone to Iran via the Caspian Sea to Anzali and then to Isfahan. But the Polish embassy had no record of his name. According to their records, there was only one person of Polish descent in Isfahan, and it was a woman. It was not Yanush the carpenter, for sure. The morgue had written a letter to the Assyrian Catholics asking for their help, but they forwarded the request to the Assyrian Orthodox and the Assyrian Protestants, who also said no. After a final negative from the Nestorian Church, there was no ground left that might receive Yanush. Some of the participants in the pointless afternoon meetings at the morgue were in favor of burying the body at midnight in an unauthorized graveyard in Awaz. G was agitated. Well, that was lovely. So let's just take a few more minutes if you want to grab another drink, get a little more to eat, and then we'll be welcoming up Brenda Cardenas. All right, everyone. This has been just a really delightful event, and thank you so much. We have one last reader tonight. Her name is Brenda Cardenas. Um, who is especially dear because she is a former poet laureate of Milwaukee. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Brenda. So Brenda Cardenas is the author of Boomerang and the chapbooks From the Tongues of Brick and Stone and Bread of the Earth, The Last Colors with Roberto Harrison from 2011. She also co-edited Between the Heart and the Land, Latina Poets in the Midwest. Cardenas's poems and essays have appeared or are forthcoming in publications such as City Creatures, Animal Encounters in the Chicago Wilderness, Angels of the Americlips, New Latina Writing, Cuadernos de A-L-D-E-E-U, Achiote Seeds, The Wind Shifts, New Latina Poetry, and The City Visible, Chicago Poetry for the New Century, among others. In 2014, the Library of Congress recorded a 40-minute recording reading of her work um, for their archive of Hispanic literature on tape. Cardenas is an associate professor in the creative writing program at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So let's welcome Brenda. Thank you for having me. Um, I feel like at, um, I'm at a translation conference, but I'm not going to be reading translations. I actually do interlingual work. So for those of you who are purists, I'm naughty, okay? <laughs> because I mix the languages. Um, and I will begin with a poem that sort of plays with that very idea. It's called Al Mestizaje. Al Mestizaje. In mi gente's hips, la clave, and from mi gente's lips sale, a fluid funky lingo fusion that fools among you call intrusion. But purity is an illusion, so if you can't dig la mezcla, chale. Es indio africana, gitana, americano, europeo, con nada feo y todo vale. El papalote, el aguacate, el tecolote, el cacahuate Y las rucas en sus trocas parqueando con los chucos Es que muchas palabras tienen alas 
son los brazos en abrazos y el gas en tus chingazos que siempre nos hacen bailar es el que nuestro choque el ole en mi pozole que todos van a celebrar hay un oso en sabroso y tanto ajo en carrajo que la verdad requiere ver y no podemos hacer nada sin un ser en la mente de mi gente que es tan inteligente hermanos se levantan las manos y todos los derechos están hechos échale es como anda la banda échale Guacha, mi totacha te da catos, un mitote de caló, es la lengua de mis cuates, un cuetazo chicano. We call Allah with ojalá, encendios with adiós, and the alma in tamal feeds us all. Órale. <laughs> so, gracias, thank you. That's partly why I mix languages. Um, I also mix them because I, people ask me what's your first language and I have to answer Spanglish. Um, I grew up in a household with um, uh, uh, first language Spanish speakers, first language, language English speakers, and first language um, Slovenian speakers, uh, all in one home. So I, I, I got accustomed to hearing a lot of tongues. <laughs> and this is a little poem that sort of reflects on that, um, that back and forth uh, between languages as a conversation between a grandfather and his granddaughter. Abuelito y sus cuentos, origin of the bird beak mole. Abuelito, what's that on your arm? Este? This little bump? CKS. Pues oye. Un día cuando era joven estaba trabajando en un jardín bellísimo. Cuando, lo and behold, a little bird swooped down and stuck his, how do you say? His beak. See, his beak in my arm, and I twisted and I twisted in circulos around and around until his beak broke off right in my muscle. Y ya, mira, tengo su nariz en el brazo. But, abuelito, what happened to the bird? Pues está en México. In Mexico, si sí, niña, the bird stayed in las montañas con sus amigos jactándose de su herida de combate. But grandpa, how can he talk? How will he even live without a beak? Oh, you know, you lose a little here, a little there. He will learn. <laughs> Thank you. And this one, again, is a, a little childhood reflection that, will, that speaks of that household. When we moved away from Tia Elias and Uncle Carl's 1968, I almost stayed put. We lived above them, see? The minute the door creaked open, me shouting from the top stair, Uncle Kaku, come get me. Tia Elia told me stories day and night, taught me to draw paint right. I wouldn't climb home until my eyes had grown heavy as the whole planet. She put magic spice in the food, made it taste like what people must eat in heaven or Mexico. She'd sing sana, sana, colita de rana all over my bumps and bruises and believe me, they would disappear. Uncle Carl always wanted me to teach him to spell night, knife, all those silent letter words because he escaped from Yugoslavia when he turned 14 and was still learning English. He learned Spanish pretty well, abuelito's kind that calls owls, tecolotes, and straws, popotes. Tia Elia's phone conversations with Tia Chole never got past him. He taught me to say English in German. I want to go to work. Then we tried to add Spanish but wound up sounding like Hansel and Gretel in a taqueria. <laughs> they named me Cacahuate, Mantequilla, Princess Red Cheeks. And I was the queen of peanut butter, sticking to them like a sandwich to the roof of your mouth. Um, I, I wrote a series of poems. Um, at one point, I was studying um, Spanish linguistics in Spanish, and it got to me. 
And so I, I started going into my room and, and meditating on sounds. My roommate at the time thought I was a little nuts because I would just be repeating these certain sounds in the Spanish language over and over again. And then I, I started to write down the images that came to my mind when I thought about and heard those sounds. And, and then from there, I crafted the poems. So I'm going to read a couple of the poems from that series. The series is called Sound Waves, and it begins with an epigraph from Victor Hernandez Cruz, who said, the river on the other side of English is carrying the message. And the first poem is called Tono, Day. Some days cushion the dental edges of our lives, like night's cool curve swerving into the music of light, dándonos the soft shoulder de voz. Danilo y Diana sweep the street of its blossoms, they hand piles of magenta petals lining the gutters de la colonia. Si hay basura, un cigarrillo acá, una lata allá, but we are blinded by hyacinth suns bursting from the pavement. When dusk sinks into la plaza, desliando our braided days, 100 black wings sing in the ceiling of leaves above Gabo's favorite cafe. The curl of caru, 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 floating like a feather to his chair. This day is una danza de dedos pressing half moons into clay, the consonant touch of tongue to teeth arching the sound away. And in that series as well, um, Intensidad, Enye. And I wrote it before they started calling us Generación Enye. So, didn't come from that. <laughs> Intensidad, Enye. El campesino rolls his shoulder blades as he turns from the furrows toward the roads curve home. Otro año, otro día, otra estación. El añejado con su añojal, Enye, the yawn in mañana. La araña weaves her web of music, tuning its strings while she sings de sus compañeras obrando en las cabañas, labrando en los, en las, los campos de caña. She holds the high notes, pulling filaments taut, and when a fly's wing touches one fiber, everything vibrates. La ñagasa del balance. A cat's arch and curled spine stretches into the long afternoon. Sueña con alimañas espiando de las montañas. Sueña con carne, the wiring tension of spring and pounce on the small boned and the broken winged, the sneer of engaño. Deep heat of day rises like a serpent from its cool tomb, entrañado beneath the sand, leaves its tilde trace, la señal that loosens and fades, one moment sliding into centuries of terrain, el diseño antiguo del futuro. Diamond-skinned Kulkulkan, guiñando desde el cielo, slides past clouds over the edge of sun at the tip of Chichen onto a shadow of stone, the equinox of a plumed past, the slow and brilliant tilt de los añosos. Coiled in mantillas pañosas y los llantos oscuros de añoranza, the fire eater waits for night to define the sharp outlines of his sustenance. La flama debajo de su seño como una piñata abriendo en una cascada de luz. Su señorada callando los gañidos desesperados de niños, eyes squeezed tight above the blackened rim of his open mouth. Enye, the grimace of resistance, un puño contra la saña del hambre. Um, and then I have a couple of more poems. Um, this one I actually did write in Spanish and did my own translation into English, so I'll, I'll read both. Uh, and it's called uh, Poema para los Tintunteros. I used to work with a band of, um, called Sonido Inquieto, and the musicians were all... Mexican-American Chicanos from Chicago, where I was living at the time in, in Pilsen. And a lot of them had come out of the punk and espanol tradition. Um, and so we used to have a whole lot of fun. And, um, and I used to have to not be able to do readings like this because I would have to go, ah, 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 you know, to get up over the music. Um, but, but one thing that I, I loved was watching the drummer and how he was always keeping time, uh, even when we weren't playing music. 
right? There's a way that drummers are always keeping the rhythm for all of us. And so this is called Poema para los Tintunteros. Este para los timbaleros, los bateristas, los tintunteros, los que tocan con cucharas en sus estufas, con lápices en sus escritorios, con uñas y nudillos en mesas, muebles, sus propias cabezas, con puños contra paredes y dedos en las espinas y curvas de sus amantes danzantes. Este para los congueros, los tamboristas, los bongoceros, los que nunca descansan con sus tacones siempre golpeando la piel del piso, zapateando en sus sueños llenos de maracas, guiros y claves. Estos baladores con pasos tan suaves y caderas que se muevan como sus hi-hats y tarolas. Este para los timbaleros, los bataristas, los tintunteros Son chingones con sus tormentas de platillos Sus huegos de palíos que vuelan como alas Qué malas sus trampas que no nos permitan trabajar ni dormir Solamente bailar y cantar, cantar y bailar Y a veces mover la tierra un poquito Poem for the tintunteros this for the timbaleros, percussionists, tintunteros, those who tap with spoons on their stoves, with pencils on their desks, with nails and knuckles on tables, beds, their own heads, with fists against walls and fingers on the spines and curves of their lovers, dancers. This for the congueros, drummers, bongoceros, those who never rest with their staccato heels always hammering the skin of the floor, stomping in their dreams, filled with maracas, guiros, and claves. These dancers with steps so smooth and hips that move like, hi like their hi-hats and snares. This for the Timbaleros, percussionists, tintunteros, they are badasses with their cymbal storms, their games of sticks that fly like wings, how scampish their tricks that won't let us work or sleep, only dance and sing and sing and dance and sometimes move the earth a little. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the work, the artwork of Guillermo Gomez Peña. I imagine that many of you are. Um, and uh, as you know, he does installation. Uh, and I, I went to view his um, piece that he did with Roberto Cifuentes called The Temple of Confessions when it was in Detroit. And it just so happened that it coincided with someone um, issuing me a challenge to write a poem in Old English alliterative verse. So I received that challenge, and the next day I went and I saw Gomez Peña's show, and I thought, oh, okay. So this is called Report from the Temple of Confessions in Old Chicano English. Se cruzan canyons in el templo de confessions, language lies across the barbed lines, piles of its limbs pierced y pinchados. Risky recordings reveal what we think of the other, offering his objectified body to the river rats who ride his wet back, the coro de coyotes who crave his flesh, the wayfaced who whisper their sin in his ear, the translators who trap and trade his tongue, la raza who receive him, la raza who repel him. In this chamber, the chill of chicken flesh, pollito mojado, picoso y picado, the black body bag of the repatriated. Here, the distorted words of debutantes, e do-gooders, of no-no-betters, e neo-Nazis, of Beowulfs and other born-again beasts, of sandal sombreros sleeping under cacti, of Machiavellian mentes y mouths, of anthropological auto-ethnography, of pretend pachucas peeling their layers, of preachers and poets with puckered lips, of the misused multicultural machinery of the Hispanic hodgepodge hiding their indio, of the Quetzalcoatl concealing their conqueror, de la migra meando, marking its turf. Here, the hemistitched hemispheres blend, a vacuum of voices absorbed in the velvet paintings of slick y sexy santos, of the Aztec icon at the altar of Aslan, tripping and turning transvestite warrior, of the cyber cholo stripping down, Simon, the vato locos liquid eye lures us over borders, their blurred, tumbling barriers calling us to come, stare into the cage, jaula de joda aquí juntándonos, the table turned and tacked to the wall, lit with 
with votives licking our luscious breakfast bowl of cucarachas on their backs, squirming to free their feet and fly. Um, so, um, the poem does have two hemistitches because they make this beautiful little gutter down the middle of the page, which for me becomes the border. Um, and it does have three alliterations per line. <laughs> I'm going to close with a, a newer piece, which in the middle of it also references another Gomez Peña uh, piece where they put, when he was working with the Border Arts Workshop, and they, they put a dinner table up on the Mexican-American border. One half was in the U.S., the other half was in Mexico. And of course, when one had to pass the salt, one had to illegally cross the border. Um, and there, that, the, the piece isn't about that, but it, it's referenced in here. It's it's called Ar Ars Resistencia. Fish bottle caps from heaps of distillery waste, sift trash from, for milk tin lids, swift, sorry, I'm sorry, let me start that again. Fish bottle caps from heaps of distillery waste, sift trash for milk tin lids, twist, crush, chain link them to each other like thousands of small arms locking Drape them into 15 by 30 foot seas of kente cloth, tapestry, grasslands swagged in wind, speckled with red wings, blue silver agama. Do this in communion with others. Urge them to reshape landscape, shift peaks and folds. Call it salvage, reuse, synergetic upcycle. Call it recover and reclaim. Call it puro rascuache, güey. Do this in memory of network, warp and weft, twist and distort texture, strike the loom. Do this in memory of mesh fences we peer through in a post-fence, wireless world, blocked and barbed just for us. Make yourself so small, the cuffs fall from your wrists. Then thread the warp, climb, crawl. Drag your dinner table a la frontera. Set one end acá in México, el otro allá. Prepare pozole with all the fixings. Invita tus amigos de ambos lados. Claro, Adelita will ask Paul to pass the heat. Los jalapeños y rábanos, por favor. Pero la migra will be waiting, watchando. Y cuando Paul's pinky sneaks over the line, they may not let him back in, ese. He'll have to sell his bowl of dreams. The least you can do is bring him some aguacate, un poquito de cilantro. Show us your fancy footwork, your disappearing act. Now you're here, ahora. Storm tomato fields spitting fricatives, snaps, snapping toxic vines, slingshot plosives at orange groves, dropping citrus into the blistered hands, reaching to picket, up the ante, plant your syllables on picket lines, pace, plant yourselves in public space, refuse to flinch, plant feet so firm, will takes root, plant will so wide, e ears sprout ancestral maize. Eat of this body, unengineered. Do this in memory of corn, potatoes, papaya, squash, tomatoes, cotton, canola, soy, beets, zucchini, cane. Do this in memory of milkweeds, monarchs, honeybees. Do this in memory of water, your last sip. Paint the winter white howl. Inscribe the undivided O. Sound the voiced and voiceless stops of hunger strike, of boycotts broken shackles. They calacas with their midnight carcajadas waking us from sleep. Thank you. Muchas gracias. See everybody in Tucson. See you there, okay? In Tucson. We just have one last hand for Kim, for Meg, for Pat, for Mariam, and for Brenda. Thank you so much. And thank you for a wonderful conference.